Okay, we're on. We're ready to go. Thanks for coming out tonight. It's pretty cold. This morning when we came to work, it was like two degrees. And if we would have been, went to four, we would have doubled. We would have been happy. <laughs> but thanks for being here tonight and for looking on. If you're streaming with us, thanks for joining us tonight. We're going to have another good lesson with Wayne here about Job in just a few minutes. But before then, we're going to read these announcements, and I'm going to say a few words to you. Uh, please keep Amy Ratley in your prayers as, as she has started chemo at Bobby Fistler. She's going to have her scan ran tomorrow, red tomorrow, I mean. Red tomorrow. red tomorrow, yeah. Okay, you probably got to call them all on that. Neil Schmidtberger will have a scan tomorrow also. Prayers would be appreciated. Joan Winkler's home from the hospital. Carol Salee requests prayers for her sister, Shirley Jordan. Shirley was rushed to ER yesterday in Arizona. The doctors believe she had a heart attack She's not doing well. Services for Angie McGraw are scheduled for this uh, Saturday at 2 o'clock here at Eastwood. Please keep Jim, the children, Lloyd and Wanda, Don and Shelby, and the rest of the family in your prayers. Soup Kitchens this coming Tuesday. Still needed is four meals in one, two dozen cookies, and servers. Sign up by the supply room if you would. A come and go shower for Crystal and Jason Hackler is Sunday, March 11th from 2 to 3.15 in the Fellowship Hall. To donate toward a gift, see Crystal DeWint or Melody Runyon. Zane Perkins will, be, will have a workshop here at Eastwood March 13th and 14th. Watch your bulletin for more information. He was here a few months ago and did an awesome job, so we invited him back. Items are being collected for the homeless in Hutchison. Anything to help them keep warm is being accepted. This includes blankets, pillows, coats, hats, gloves, etc. Put your items on the pews in the south foyer over here. Yesterday, it was full of blankets and things. This morning, I came in, they were all gone. And Jim and Jerry Anches came in, and they, they were happy to deliver those to the homeless people. That was very nice of them, wasn't it? Let's go to our Father in prayer. Father, we thank you for being our God. We thank you for helping us out and, and answering our prayers and listening to our requests and giving us all the blessings we've received through your son, Jesus. Father, we just uh, ask you to be with all these people on our sick list, whether in the bulletin or on our list tonight. We just know we have several that need your care. We want you to put your arms around them, let them know that they're loved by you, whether they're sick physically or mentally because of, of people that are lost in their family or they have a physical ailment, either one. We pray that you would help them if you would, please. We thank you for our nice building we have to come when it's cold out like this to, to uh, enjoy one another's company and open your book one more time. We thank you for the blessings of Jesus and we thank you that we're his brother and you uh, call us your children. We're thankful for that. We're thankful for the church that we're part of that he died for. Father, just help us and help us to have wisdom and insight on how to open this book and, and use it and in our daily living, that we can apply it, and it might show to other people that are watching us that we might shine our light. Thank you, Father, for the forgiveness of sins, and it's his name we pray. Amen. I'm going to take you back to when I was 12 years old. I know that's a vision, but I'm going to do it. Okay. <laughs> I want to do that because... I was 12 years old when I was baptized into Christ. I was, and I was baptized uh, in Lyons, Kansas, not at the new church building they have now, but at the old one over on Taylor and Bell. And the vision is, I got this preacher in mind that baptized me, and I want you to think about who baptized you if you're baptized, and what happened in your conversion, and how many years ago, and all those kind of things. That's what I want to talk about for just a minute. But I have this vision in mind of the man that baptized me, He's an elderly gentleman, and what's funny, it's not really funny, but what's funny to me is he had a wooden leg, and that's how I remember him so well. Okay, so yeah, he kept the wooden leg on when he baptized me in the water. He didn't take it off. He was in the Korean War, and he, and he was driving a tank, and he got hit by a bazooka, and the shrapnel went all over his leg, and he had to amputate his leg, so he had a, a wooden leg. And following after that, about, I don't know, six months later, he was also my counselor at church camp when I went for the very first time. Now, you know, I don't know how many ever, how many of you went to church camp way back when I was 12. That'd have been like 64, okay? But anyway, we still had tents. We had army cots. Uh, I can't remember if we had concrete floors or wooden floors. I can't remember. 
but that was the way it was back then, okay? We've come a long way since then at camp and everybody else. But you're, I'm thinking back in the days of my conversion when I, when I learned to walk with Jesus and people were trying to help me out. You know, my grandfather was there for me. He was with me every step of the way. And usually everybody has somebody that can help them out on their Christian walk. Uh, you know, and as I grew older, you know, when I was about 15, 14 or 15, I was, in, I was in Lions. We didn't have a youth group like we do here and like we've always had for a long time. If I had two or three my age in Lions, Kansas, I was doing well. Well, there was a youth activity here one time when I was about 14, 15, and I walked in this auditorium, and it looked like the Taj Mahal. I mean, it looked like the, the Superdome to me because I was used to this little auditorium that held about 80 to 100, and now I'm in this place. I think this place holds about 450 when it's full. It, it's just I couldn't believe it. And, and then when Patty and I got married in 73, we came up here to be members of this church, and here I am again. This is the place I walked in when I was 15. I couldn't believe I'm here, back here again. doesn't look near as big as it did then. And now it doesn't look that big to me at all, compared to, especially if you're going to compare it to somebody like you know, Northside or someplace like that. That holds a lot more. But what I want to tell you is this. From the time I was baptized up until now, you can reminisce and think about all the things that's ever happened to you and think about how you got to this stage and how you can think of the trials and tribulations you went through and how you got through them. If you read the book of James, uh, you know, 1 uh, verse 2 and so, it talks to you about trials and tribulations will come your way, but if you persevere, you're going to be better off for it. And I can think of those kind of times in my life when those things happen to me, and I know you can too. But then even, you know, coming up, I got married, had kids, went to Salina, uh, went to Lions, come back here full circle, and I'm thinking all of those things in all my life, looking back and reminiscing, what have I learned, and what has the Lord taught me, and how have I grown? So I'm thinking, I think there's some biblical things in here to teach us about growing, and I want to read chapter 5 of Hebrews, verses 11 and 12. The writer here in Hebrews is talking to the people, and he's trying to encourage them, and he's going to be talking about Christ, and he says, concerning him, who is Christ, we have much to say. And it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. He's kind of getting on their case. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have to come, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. So it makes me think, am I eating solid food today or am I still on the bottle? You know, we have to think about those things once in a while. And I think when you go over to Second Peter, the first chapter, and you look at those Christian virtues that's listed there, I think this is a good gauge, this is a good barometer, this is a good scale to look at to see if you have grown. So let's look at this, <clears throat> look and start in verse 5. Now for this reason, also applying all diligence, in your faith supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence knowledge, see it's building on one another as you grow and you, and you get more experience, and in your knowledge, self-control, your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. For the, if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm, I'm asking and I'm, I'm saying this to myself as well. I can look at these Christian virtues through my lifetime have I gotten off the bottle? And I, am I eating meat now? Have I gotten that far? Have I improved each and every year that I was a Christian since my conversion that I told you about? I'm hoping so. And I'm hoping that's what we all strive for because that's what Jesus wants us to do. Qual's going to lead us in a couple of songs. Eight hundred and seventy-five. If you have the hymn book. 875. We're seeing all the, the stances. If for the price we have striven, after our labors are old, rest to our souls will be given on the eternal shore. Home of the soul, blessed King, of life, 
free from all care and wherefore no nigh of in the storm we are sighing for thee beautiful home out there ransom beside a crystal sea yes the sweet rest is remaining for the true children of god where there will be no complaining never a chastening rod home of the soul blessed king the of life free from all care and where fall no night of in the storm we are sighing for thee beautiful home of the ransom beside a crystal sea soon the bright homeland adorning we shall behold a glad dawn lean on the lord to the morning trust you the night is gone home of the soul blessed king the of life free from all care and where fall no night of in the storm we are sighing for thee beautiful home of the ransom beside a crystal sea Usually I take about 40 minutes to travel from Hutchinson to uh, Sterling College. And I go by Avenue Q to watch Lions. And I memorize all the songs and I just sing to my God. I wish you were with me. Then you guys can have the background. <laughs> all right, uh, our next hymn. Again, I memorize that hymn also. They are very meaningful, that's why I memorize them. Yeah. Uh, 792, 792, it's right up there. Okay, 792. We'll sing twice. My eyes are dry, my faith is old, my heart is high, my prayers are cold. And I know how I ought to be alive to you and dead to me. What can be done to an old heart like mine, softened it up with oil and wine? The you, your spirit of love, please wash me anew in the wine of your blood. My eyes are dry, my faith is so, my heart is hard. My prayers are cold, and I know how I ought to be alive to you and dead to me. What can be done to an old heart like mine, softened it up? With oil and wine, the all is you, your spirit of love. Please wash me anew with the wine of your blood. Just beautiful. Did somebody say something? Yes. Hi, Michelle. Yeah. Yeah. 
All right. All right. All right. How about we pray for him here tonight? Would that be okay? Let's go ahead. Yes. Emmy. All right. Sarah's young. That was kind of ill. We talked about on Sunday. All right. Let's do that. Yeah. Let's continue in the spirit of prayer here. Okay. Father, as we uh, come before you here this evening, uh, we thank you for our gathering together here this evening, Father, as a, as a community, as a family of faith, where we can study your word, we can encourage one another with our reaction, interactions with one another, our time together. But Father, it is a great honor, a great privilege to lift up uh, precious souls uh, 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 that we're related to, that's part of our spiritual family, folks that we know that, uh, that are on our hearts and our minds, and we want to pray for for Jonathan and uh, his heart doctor appointment tomorrow, we pray that it all goes well. Father, that your hand we, would be upon him, that you would strengthen his heart, and that he would have a good report. Father, help him to have a good night's rest here in preparation for that meeting tomorrow. Father, we pray for young Emmy and uh, her situation being uh, under the weather and sick, and we just ask for your healing hand to be upon her father restore her health and help take that that pressure off the family and help her to get back to school and her normal activities of the day father we ask now for your guidance and your blessing upon studying your word this evening in jesus we pray amen, amen. all right we are glad that you are all here tonight this was kind of an interesting thought as i was walking up i was like you know i was uh, born in palm springs california which is a nice warm toasty place I uh, grew up in southeastern Arizona, Wilcox, Arizona, graduated from U University of Arizona in uh, Tucson, so all blazing hot places. I thought, man, it's going to be so miserable getting out of the house and coming down to the church. I was like, you know, it doesn't even feel that bad to me. And I, it's like five or ten degrees out there, so I think I'm finally adapting to Kansas weather. So. <laughs> We are glad that you're here. Not so bad of, of, you know, getting out in the weather. We're glad you're all here. We ought to give you a sticker, though. You know, if it's below, you know, 30 degrees, yeah, I got to get a sticker for coming on Wednesday night and join us. So we're, we're thrilled to have you and always appreciate those watching online to be part of our class as well. Now, we are going through kind of a heavy part of study in the book of Job. So if you'll be going over there, going over there. Um, we're going to jump in on chapters 8, 9, and 10 uh, here this evening. But maybe just to lighten things up a, a little bit, because again, he is going through a difficult time, and he's going to go through a cycle of speeches. Things that Job has said, what some of his friends have said that haven't been all that helpful. We're going to see another evidence of that here tonight. We'll see that in several weeks to come. There's many cycles of these speeches that his friends are telling him, Job, here's why you're suffering the way you are. Him pleading with God, uh, sharing his complaints with God. It does get a lot of fun when God starts asking him questions. That's a fun couple chapters. And then, of course, in the end, we know it all turns out quite well. But we've got to go through the storm system. We've got to walk through with him through some of these difficult times before we can get to uh, some of the, the blessed times at the end of the book. But I thought, you know, Let's, how would you answer this? You know that you're having a bad day when? And so I came across a few here, and I want you to add a few with me. Um, you know you're having a bad day when your horn sticks on the freeway and you're sitting behind 32 Hell's Angels motorcycles. That's a bad day. There's two more. You know that you're having a bad day when your birthday cake collapses from the weight of all the candles. All right, that would be a pretty bad day. Or um, uh, what was it? Uh, this one with the, with the four-year-old. Yeah, yeah, the four-year-old tells you that it's almost impossible to flush a grapefruit down the toilet. You know that's going to be a bad day. They said that was almost impossible for us to do. How about you? You know you're having a bad day when? What, what, when you're having a bad day, what's going on? The weather is in single digits, Cynthia says. All right, when it's like seven degrees outside, oh, this is going to be a, a tough day. It's frozen outside and you don't have any groceries in the house. 
frozen outside and there's no groceries and you know you have to get out there and go buy some. Yeah, yeah, all right. You know you're having a bad day. Don, were you going to say something? You had that look of, ooh, I see the gears turning here. No? Yeah, you'll have one. You'll have one going on. Alan, do you have one? You're having a bad day. What, what's an example of a bad day here? Hot water tank goes out. Maybe while you're taking a shower or something, all of a sudden, psh, you know, oh boy, that would be a bad one there. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, having to pay for that. How about one more? You know, you're having a bad day if this happens. That somebody, yeah, really irritates you, and, and uh, yeah, maybe at the start of the day, and say, I've been grumbling about that all day long. Okay, that's kind of tough. Okay, so let's jump in here to uh, chapter uh, number eight, and let's hear from one of uh, uh, Job's friends and his thoughts on here uh, is why you are suffering the way that you are. All right, listen to what he says. Verse one. Then Bildad the Shuhite replied, okay, so he's got three friends that have come and sat over there with him on the, on the ash heap for about seven days. Job finally said something, so that gave Eliphaz permission. Eliphaz more than likely was the oldest. He was going to be the kindest, the most articulate, and the most positive of his friends, but still has a lot of things wrong. Uh, Bildad's probably right there in the middle. He's going to be very blunt and kind of uh, curt in his response to Job, but shows a little bit of, of, of hope. Um, uh, the other one, Zophar, he, we'll see him next week. He's not nice at all in things that he has to say about Job. But let's see what uh, Bildad has to say. How long will you say such things? Your words are a blustering wind. So Job has just poured out his heart to his friends. Here's why I'm suffering. Here's how I'm hurting. He describes his suffering. Uh, he doesn't know why God is punishing him for doing this. He wishes that he was dead. Why did God even allow me to live? And his friend, one of his dear friends, comes up and said, how long are you going to be like a blustering wind? Basically, Job, you're a big windbag with all the things that you're saying. Now, how would that make you feel as a friend? A friend says something like that to you. Uh, doesn't, sound like a friend to me. doesn't sound like a friend to me. And that's, you know, when you know you're having a bad day when some of your closest friends say stuff like that to you. All right, he's not done yet. Let's see what else he's. <laughs> Steve said he's only a shoe height, you know. I might have stepped on that guy. That's the old joke, you know, who is the smallest person in the Bible? You know, everybody thinks Nehemiah. No, it's not Nehemiah, it's Bildad the Shuhite, you know, okay? All right. Yeah, that, that, that had to be Steve, you know, bringing that up. Okay. All right, so he said, you're nothing but a big windbag. All right, he continues on. Verse 3, does God pervert justice? Does the Almighty pervert what is right? When your children sinned against him, he gave them over to the penalty of their sin. But if you will look to God and plead with the Almighty... If you are pure and upright even now, he'll rouse himself on your behalf and restore you to your rightful place. Your beginnings will seem humble, so prosperous will your future be. Okay, now, part of the great loss that Job had, you know, was his, his assets, his uh, employees, but the most painful part of his loss was the death of his 10 children. Now, what did his friend, Bildad, believe was the cause of their death? They sinned, so God punished them, okay? So this is a very, very common theological belief, the law of retribution. Law of retribution. We might hear it couched in a little different terminology. It's still the same. You ever heard somebody say, man, that's some really bad karma? May see that? I hear that all the time. That's Eastern philosophy that's coming in uh, to our Western world of thought. And so we use uh, this term karma all the time. What does karma say? What does that mean to have some bad karma? What has happened? 
kind of bad luck. You're doing bad things. Bad things are going to happen. You have good things going on in your life. You've got good karma. Very similar to the law of retribution. So here, Bildad, Eliphaz, uh, he elaborated on that. Zophar is going to bring this up. Um, your kids did some awful things. God is punishing them for their sin. That's why they died. Now, how would you feel about that? Friend has called you a, a big windbag, and uh, your kids, your ten kids that died, it's because of their sin. Okay? Yeah, Helen. Yes. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. All right. So he Helen shares with us here tonight, even. In church situations today, in our modern times, this theology still floats around to say, well, what have you done to cause that suffering that you've done, okay? All right, now, the thing about a lie is the more truth that's in that lie, the more easy it is for us to believe. Is there some elements in the law of retribution that are true? Yes or no? In the law of retribution, all right, there is, okay? We do reap what we sow, all right? But, also our children, yeah. you know, we're, as we're, we're their parents, uh -huh. we're responsible for them as well. Yes. And their sin comes back to the Father because of the sin. All right, so there are some truths in that, isn't yeah. there? All right. But, Tim, uh, or Carrie, which one do you prefer? I call you either one, so. Call me Tim. Tim, all right, so let's stick with Tim here. So Tim points it out. You can even have that in a parent-child relationship uh, uh, there. But is it possible to be a really good and godly uh, parent or couple and have several kids very, very faithful to the Lord, but for whatever reason, one of them chooses to kind of rebel against God? Is that possible? Well, sure. We all know examples of that. Yeah, there's the key. So... This isn't always true in every scenario. When it is applicable, yes. If you sow bad things, yeah, it's natural that you're going to reap consequences. But um, sometimes it isn't always. We, we looked at some scriptures last week from the New Testament that some people's sins go before them. Uh, some may come much later that we don't find out that they were involved in these things. They never had anything negative happen in this life. But in the next life, they're being held accountable in the judgment for those kinds of things. So there are some truths, and, and Job's even going to admit that to him. But you and I know it wasn't because of any sins that his children had done that they died. Who was responsible for the death of Job's children? Satan was. Satan was. All right. That's true. That's, that's where a lot of people miss um, in the study of the uh, uh, book of Job. Uh, Alan's pointing out. What would you say is the main point of the book? How would you say that? Yes. That's right. That is really the main point of the book is how God has proven this point to Satan that, you know, Job is faithful to me, not because of blessings and all that, but because that's his nature there. So it's not the nature of suffering. That's kind of a side, you know, theme of the book of Job. But the main one is to prove that Satan was wrong when what he was saying about God and about Job. Okay. Yes, yes. For his, at least months, we, we discovered he's suffering with this stuff for months, perhaps a year or two that he's going through all of this stuff. He doesn't see the benefit and the blessing. You know, Steve was pointing out, you know, and, and maybe we can make this point a little bit later in the class, you know, the things that we go through and experience in life, you know, later on this side, kind of looking back, wow, that really strengthened me, helped me to grow. But, you know, when you and I are in the midst of that storm, is that particularly fun to go through? No, no, it really isn't. But, you know, it really tries this. Go ahead, Alan. It does. It draws him closer. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're definitely closer after this experience here. Okay, well, let's, let's keep on with, uh, with build at then. So, basically, your children suffer because of their sin. But, you know, if you're pure and upright, you do the right thing, God's going to bless you. 
All right, now, here's what he cites as, as his evidence here, verse 8. Ask the former generations. Find out what their fathers learned. For we were only bo born yesterday and know nothing, and our days on earth are but a shadow. Um, will they not instruct you and tell you? Will they not bring forth words from their understanding? So he's saying, okay, look to the forefathers. Look to the generations before us. This has been around for a long time. Now, Job belongs to that patriarchal period of world and Bible history. And so he could be going back to like the days of Methuselah. And how long were some of those guys living back in those days? Oh, even well, even beyond that, 900 years. Was it 969 for Methuselah? So he said, this is, this is nothing new. We, he said, we're but kids, you know. Well, we, we don't know all that. Go back to their, they know that this law of ret retribution is true. You do bad things, bad things happen to you. Do good things, good things happen to you. Let them instruct you. Then he asked some rhetorical questions here. He said, can papyrus grow tall where there is no marsh? No. Can reeds thrive without water? No. While still growing and uncut, they wither more quickly than grass. Yes, got that. Such is the destiny of all who forget God. So perishes the hope of the godless. What he trusts in is fragile. All right? So he talks about some kind of fragile things here to say, all right, here is what the wicked are like. You know, if you are being godless and you're not trusting in God, you're disobeying God, you're like, you know, some of these plants that kind of grow up and wither. Then he gives them another illustration uh, of a spider web. Look at this. What he trusts in is fragile. What he relies on is a spider's web. And he leans on the web, but it gives way. He clings hold to it, but it does not hold. He's like a well-watered plant in the sunshine, spreading its shoots over the garden. It entwines its roots around a pile of rocks and looks for a place among the stones. But when it's torn from its spot, that place disowns it and says, I never saw you. Surely its life withers away, and from the soil other plants grow. And so here he's showing just how fragile the life is of these ungodly people. Now, isn't that a terrible thing when you're like out in the garden and stuff? You're out there doing all your work. You come back the next day and a spider has built this big old thing and you walk into it. Psh, you know, it just goes all over you. And you're hoping it's not one of those big old wolf spiders or something like that. You're like, oh, goodness. Do we have any spider lovers in here? Some people actually like spiders. Whatever you do, don't try to step on a tarantula. Can I tell you a little story that didn't creep you out too much? When I was living in uh, Oklahoma, uh, we had a, a camp uh, down by uh, Ardmore Davis, Oklahoma. Uh, uh, Petty John, yeah, Petty John Bible Camp down there. And so I was a counselor down there, and for whatever reasons, there were several tarantulas, you know, walking around out there. And I thought, watch this. One of those things was walking over there, and I said, I'm just going to squish that thing, you know. So I go to step on it. Do you know what that thing did? It hopped up on its two back legs, put out its other legs, and hissed at me. <laughs> I literally was like walking on water getting away from that thing. I didn't know they would do that. Same thing happened to me. Oh, no. mercy. Here, I grew up in the desert and everything. I'd never seen anything like that, you know. Well, I sure. Over, I, over the, I didn't know they did. <laughs> we used to have a member here that had a pet tarantula, and I went over to visit him, and he put it on his face. Man, that was the shortest visit you know I've ever. <laughs> man, I said, I'm done with this. Yeah, wow. Sure. So, for you, uh, you, you spider lovers, may God bless you, but keep them, keep them far away. Yeah, keep them away. That's right. Okay. So he said, that's how brittle that they are. Now he kind of summarizes his little argument here. Surely God does not reject a blameless man or stre uh, strengthen the hands of the evildoers. He will fill your mouth with laughter. Your lips will shout of joy. Your enemies will clothe in shame. And the tents of the wicked will be no more. All right? So basically, Job, here's what you need to do. If you'll repent, You'll do the right thing. You start doing godly things again. Oh, man, God's going to bless you. You're going to be so happy and joyful. Everything's going to be fine and good. Okay? So, um, Bildad here has some negative and has some positive. But the thing is, is um, 
it's not true what he's saying to Job here. Okay, so when adversity hits, let's be cautious, and U G I O U S, with our theological advice. C E or S E on advice? C E. All right. I don't have my automatic spell checker. I get spoiled with that thing there. All right. So be careful with our theological advice. Now, last week we talked about what are some things, you know, that people say that are very help, uh, hurtful in our time of suffering. I mean, you guys were rattling off stuff left and right there. And uh, this one needs to really be on there. Be cautious with our theological advice. Now, if someone is very, very sincere and they're asking for what are your thoughts, what are your opinions on some things, that's the opportunity to share. Um, it's much better just to be present and to listen and to acknowledge the pain and suffering that people are going through. Uh, then in those times then to jump upon, you know, I've got it all figured out. I know why you're suffering. You're doing some sinful stuff. God's punishing you, trying to discipline you. You stop doing that, God's gonna bless you. That was not helpful at all to Job. Okay, now let's see Job's response to this guy that calls him a windbag, says that his children have died because of their sin, but if he had just repent, um, all would be well. Let's see what he has to say on that. Start with me in verse 1. Then Job replied, Indeed, I know that this is true. So he, he, he uh, you know, uh, understands that some of the things that, you know, Bildad's telling him, that that's true. In principle, what you're telling me is true. But here's the question that I have. How can a mortal be um, righteous before God? Though one wished to dispute with him, he could not answer him one time out of a thousand. His wisdom is profound. His power is vast. Who has resisted him and come out, out, uh, out scathed or unscathed? So he's going to say, all right, now who am I as a mortal that I can kind of have this argument and this debate with God? You know, how am I ever going to get a chance here with God? And he, and he breaks it down how powerful God is over all of creation. This is really interesting. Verse 5, speaking of God, he moves mountains without their knowing it. He overturns them in his anger. He shakes the earth from its place. He makes its pillars tremble. He speaks to the sun. It does not shine. He seals off the light of the stars. He alone stretches out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. He is the maker of the bear and Orion, the Pleiades and the constellations of the south. He performs wonders that cannot be fathomed, miracles that cannot be counted. All right. What is the bear and Orion and all that? What is he talking about there? Yeah, the different constellations in the sky. Isn't that amazing that they knew that all the way back in Bible times? I was reading an article, I think it might have been National Geographic or something like that, uh, a little while ago, and it talked about uh, looking into the night sky and looking at the stars and the Milky Way and the constellations and stuff, and they said, you know, up to about, you know, 120 years ago, you know, before we had radio and uh, television and smartphones and stuff like that, you know what people did a lot with their time in the evening? They stargazed. Wow, you see, you know, the stars and moving around the planets and the phases of the moons and stuff. I was watching, what was uh, one of those uh, Alaskan shows? What's the, what? the Northern Lights. Whoa, can you imagine? You know, in our scientific days, we kind of know what's causing all that. But imagine a couple hundred years ago, and you went up and saw those Northern Lights and green and yellow jumping around. What would you be thinking was going on there? Wow, just thinking about the power and the majesty of God to kind of create a world like this. And so, um, you know, I always encourage people, get out in God's creation and see his beauty and his handiwork. It's all around us. The heavens declare the glory of God. So he, he's talking about how powerful God is. Then look at how powerful God is over even creatures and stuff. Verse number 11. He said, when he, speaking of God, passes me, I cannot see him. That's the invisible nature of God. And where he goes, I cannot perceive him. If he snatches away, who could stop him? Who can say to him, what are you doing? God does not restrain his anger. Even the cohorts of Rahab cowered at his feet. 
Rahab was kind of a mythological sea monster. You know, just think of these ancient mariners, you know, you think of all the different whales and large things that are in the sea that, hey, maybe even sea monsters deep in the, in the ocean, they have to acknowledge the power of God. Verse 14, how then can I dispute with him? How can I find words to argue with him? Though I were innocent, I could not answer him. I could only plead with my judge for mercy. Even if I summoned him, he responded, I do not believe he would give me a hearing. He would crush me with a storm. Multiply my wounds for no reason. He would not let me regain my breath, but would overwhelm me with misery. If it's a matter of strength, he's mighty. And if it's a matter of justice, who will summon him? Even if I were innocent, my mouth would condemn me. If I were blameless, it would be pronounced, it'd pronounce me guilty. Although I am blameless, I have no concern for myself. I despise my own life. If it is all the same, that is why I say he destroys both the blameless and the wicked, when a scourge brings sudden death, he mocks the despair of the innocent. And when land falls into his hands of the wicked, he blindfolds its judges. If it, if it is not he, then who is it? He's really attributing a lot of negative things to God. He's saying, even if I'm innocent, if I'm blameless, God's going to punish me. Uh, he punishes the good. He punishes the evil. Now, are these true about God? No, they're not. God's going to kind of hold him accountable for some of the things that he's saying. Now, last week we talked about the importance of allowing people to express their pain. Um, it is very difficult to heal if we haven't taken the time to reveal. Okay? And so God's allowing him to express his thoughts and opinions, but he's going to give him some accountability for some of the accusations that he's making against God. He's not sinning against God, but he's saying some things that are not true but he, he can't understand this. He's like, I've been living uh, blameless. I'm a, I'm a man after God. I offer sacrifices for my kids even in case they might have sinned. Why is God punishing me this way? He just can't understand it. So we're hearing his frustration just bubble out of him. So now he talks about the shortness of his life. Verse 25. My days are swifter than a runner. And that would be like some kind of messenger that would be given a message and then they'd run and drop off that message. The, they fly away without a glimpse of joy. They skim past like boats of papyrus, like eagles swooping down on their prey. If I say I will forget my complaint, I will change my expression and smile. I dread all my sufferings, for I know you will not hold me innocent. Since I'm already found guilty, why should I struggle in vain? Even if I wash myself with soap, my hands with washing soda, you'd plunge me into the slime pit so that even my clothes would detest me. He is not a man like me that I might answer him, that we might confront each other in court. If only there were someone to arbitrate between us, to lay his hand upon us both, someone to remove God's rod so that his terror would frighten me no more, then I would speak up with, uh, without fear of him. But as it is now, uh, but as it is now stands with me, I can not. And so he's like, I need a mediator. I need someone to arbitrate between me and God, just so I could share my case, my, my court in heaven with him to say, I haven't done anything wrong. If I've done something wrong, would you please prove it to me where I've done these things? He said, man, I could clean myself up, wash my hands, put on soda, and God would just dump me down into the slime pit so that even my clothes would detest me. It reminded me of <laughs> one of our uh, AIM students that we had recently here, a uh, young man named Matt. He was a lot of fun to have around. And uh, one of their assignments was to locate different things around town. And so we sent him down to Cary Park to take a picture. Okay, here's where Cary Park is. And um, you know how they have uh, kind of the ponds out there and stuff like that? And in the cold weather here, some of that stuff freezes over. And so imagine, you know, 18, 19, 20-year-olds, whenever you have little frozen ponds, what might be a temptation to do? So they had their video, of course, you know, young people have their little cameras and their videos. Out. They're acting like they're skating around out there and stuff. And then one of the girls said, I bet you won't run across that thing, okay? He's from some, like, warm weather state, I think, down in Arkansas. He's like, oh, yeah, let's try it. Whew, whew. Halfway out there, guess what he does? Zoom! You ought to see. I've got a copy of the video if you ever want to see it. He just sinks. And then start swimming like crazy, you know, to get over there. He's just dripping wet with all that uh, scummy water over there and then the park and stuff like that. 
Oh, boy. Made my heart skip a beat when I saw it. I was like, oh, please, please. Uh, I'm responsible to the AIM program and their parents and all that. Let's not do those kinds of things, all right? So that's what um, Job feels that God will do to him. If he only had an arbitrator, somebody to kind of speak for him. Now, let's talk about that for just a, a second here. See if we can find uh, that verse I'm looking for. Yeah, over here in 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Let's turn there. Keep your spot here in Job. We'll be back to Job in just a few minutes. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. talks about the uh, importance of prayer, but then uh, it also speaks about a mediator, too. <clears throat> Verse 1, I urge then, first of all, so this ought to be a priority in the church, that requests and prayers and intercession, thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and for all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and, and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good, pleases God our Savior, who wants all men to be saved. And to come to a knowledge of God. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all men. All right. Sometimes if I'm uh, working with a... Uh, uh, younger person that may not be as familiar with the scriptures or maybe uh, somebody, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old and they're thinking about uh, becoming a Christian, being baptized, you know, sometimes it's good to have like maybe some visual aids to uh, look at. And so we might talk about the gospel as good news about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And I like to use, you know, maybe a little visual aid, some of you can see this, that there is one mediator between God and men the man Christ Jesus. So here's us, mankind down here. God up here, Jesus is the mediator. Now why is Jesus the only mediator? Because the world tries to put a lot of different people. They could put another individual in there, could put a group in there, could put a church in there. But the scriptures teach that Jesus is the only mediator between God and mankind. How does he allow that bridge, that chasm, to be crossed through him alone? All right, it's through his sacrifice on the cross, but why, why is that palatable there? Yes, and because he touches both sides, doesn't he? Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So here's humanity over here, here's God, here's sin that separates us from God. The wages of sin is death. But, 1 Peter 3, 18, Christ died for sins once for all the righteous, for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. Through his death on the cross, it allows us as human beings to connect with God, to be with one, uh, with God again. All right? Yeah. Yes. So he touches the, the, the human part and the divine part and allows us to bridge that gap. That's what Job was not aware of the Messiah. He was not aware of the Son of God. He wished, man, if I only had a mediator to mediate between me and God. Well, we are blessed to know that we have Jesus as our mediator that allows us to have that, that access relationship with God. So let's, when we're adversity hits, let's, let's encourage people to turn to the mediator. when we're talking about Jesus, to turn to Jesus. And sometimes we can be those, those hands and those feet and those, and, and those, those lips and, and words of comfort from Jesus to that person. To, you know, a lot of times people just need to have somebody to talk to, to visit with, to kind of get some things off their chest, you know, just so that they can kind of carry this load, you know. Uh, what does the book of Galatians talk about? you know, about carry ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And so we need to be able to walk with people. Bildad wasn't doing too good of a job. He had theological advice, kind of leaving him out on his own. He said, man, I just ha wish I had a mediator. What if he would have had somebody that had more understanding, compassion? He said, I wish I had the kindness of friends. 
He will talk about his friends. He said, you guys are worthless counselors. You guys are worthless counselors. They have not helped his situation at all. All right, let's finish up chapter 10 then. He's not done with uh, the pain of his heart in dealing with this situation. Chapter 10. Here's how he's feeling about his life. <clears throat> he said, I loathe my very life. Therefore, I will give free reign to my complaint. Speak out of the bitterness of my soul. I will say to God, do not condemn me, but tell me what charges you have against me. So he said, all right, I'm standing up. I'm going to say what's on my heart and what's on my mind. Please, God, be patient. Don't condemn me. Let me get this out. Verse 3, here's a question he asks. Does it please you to oppress me, to spurn the work of your hands, while you smile on the schemes of the wicked? Do you have eyes of flesh? Do you see as a mortal sees? Are your days like those of a mortal? Uh, your years like those of man, that you must search out my faults and probe after my sin, though you know that I'm not guilty and that no one can rescue me from your hand. He's like, God, are you like some people that just get a delight at picking at others? You ever met folks like that? Sometimes it's our kids. They like picking and tormenting one another, you know, touching each other when they're in the back of the car or something like that. Um, and kids grow into be adults sometimes, too. You ever met some people in the workplace or around town or maybe your next-door neighbor? They get no greater joy than to see you get flustered and upset. I mean, they just like to pick at you, to goad you. You know, some just do it in good nature. Some do it very intentionally, very maliciously there. He's like, God, is that what you're doing? Just kind of looking at any part of my life to make me miserable? Verse 8, your hand shaped me. You made me. Will you now turn and destroy me? Remember that you molded me like clay. Will you now turn me to dust again? Did you not pour me out like milk and curdle me like the cheese? Clothe me with skin and flesh and knit me together with my bones and my sinews. Uh, you gave me life. You showed me kindness and in your providence watched over my spirit. But this is what you concealed in your heart. And I know that this was in your mind. So who does he believe created him? Who made Job? Yeah, and he used some very poetic ways. And he's like, you know, kind of in the conception process, it's like cottage cheese. You know, he's kind of mixed me all up like cottage cheese. You clothed me with skin and flesh, put me together. You built me, you, you made me, and now you have set me up to suffer. Did you make me and create me just so that you could torment me and, and terrorize me? He's like, man, was I predestined to have all this suffering? Is that what you've done, God? He's just pouring out his questions, what was on his heart. Verse 14, if I sinned, you'd be watching me. and would not let my offense go unpunished. If I am guilty, woe to me. If I'm innocent, I can't lift my head for I'm full of shame and drowned in my affliction. If I hold my head high, you stalk me like a lion. And again, display your awesome power against me. You bring new witnesses against me and increase your anger towards me. Your forces uh, come against me with wave after wave. He said, God, you're like a lion prowling around, seeing somebody to devour. Now, who in the scriptures is described like a lion seeking somebody to devour? Satan is, but God isn't. He said, man, you've got all kinds of extra witnesses that are coming against me. Bildad, Zophar, Eliphaz. So it's like, God, are you sending these people to torment my life? Verse 18. Why then did you bring me out of the womb? I wish I had died before an eye saw me. If I only had never come into being or had been carried straight from the womb to the grave, am not my few days almost over? Turn away from me so I can have a moment of joy before I go to the place of no return, to the land of gloom and deep shadow, to the land of deepest night, of deep shadow and disorder, where even... The light is like darkness. He's like, you know what? I wish I was never born. Wish I would never have lived. It'd be better than the situation that I'm in. He's like, God, just give me a break. Just give me some relief before I go to. Notice his understanding of the afterlife. We've seen this term, Sheol. What did he feel like the afterlife was like? Well, how does he describe that in uh, verse 21 and 22? Because remember, he doesn't have all the revelation that you and I have on this side of things. Gloom, shadow, it's a place you don't come back. He doesn't understand about a resurrection and stuff like that. Yeah, it's like, you know, God, I know you're real. I know there's this physical existence. 
and then we die, but we just kind of go to this shadowy spirit world or something like that. And, and he said, at least that would be better than all the physical suffering that I'm in. Um, so he knows very little about the afterlife here, but he said any of that would be better than the situation that he was facing, all right? Now, we've got to end on a positive note here. Ecclesiastes 3, verse 11 will be our, our final verse that we'll look at. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Great book in the wisdom literature format. <clears throat> All right, we're going to pick up in uh, verse 9 of chapter 3, verse 9 through 11. What does the worker gain from his toil? I've seen the burden God has laid on men. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He also sets eternity in the hearts of men, yet they can't fathom what God has done from beginning to end. So here the Ecclesiastes writer does talk about the challenge, the burden that we have in life. And there is a weight to life. Uh, Jesus will say e every day has enough trouble of its own. Let's not worry about what's going to happen in the future. So every day is going to have some trouble. There's some burden in it. But I love how he said he has made everything beautiful in its time. So a lot of times when we're going through these painful times and these trials, it's not, it doesn't seem too beautiful then. But if we were able to see maybe a little later on the work that God is doing in us, forming in us, you know, it's going to be beautiful at the proper time. Then like how he says he puts eternity in the hearts of men, but you and I know there is a life beyond this life. And, and where does that come from? God puts it in us. And so that's where we want to make preparation to say, you know, as rough as it is down here, we do have a heavenly home that we're looking forward to, that beautiful paradise, heavenly paradise of God. No more sin, no more suffering, no more trial. We're with the Lord, with the angels, with the godly of all the ages, and what a joy that ought to bring to our heart. And so even though Job is going through some suffering, and so we're going to hear a few more weeks of uh, some of the advice of his friends, Job arguing with them, pouring out his heart before God, uh, God is doing some beautiful things in his life. And so, don't know where you're at here tonight. Maybe you have some struggles and, and, and burdens on that. Let's give it over to the Lord. Let's trust him. Let's thank him for the process of what he's doing in our life. Okay, let's bow for a word of prayer and we'll be done. Father, we thank you for the study of your word. Um, uh, it just amazes us as we look at Job, the suffering that uh, he went through. Um, Father, the... Uh, uh, the vulnerability of his heart uh, that's been laid out in your sacred scripture for us to read, even all us, these thousands of years later, uh, we can relate to an appreciable degree. We've all suffered. We've been through difficult times. We've asked why questions in our life and, and poured out our hearts. Uh, Father, you have been a, a mediator. You've been comforting to us. Uh, Father, we thank you in advance for the work um, that you're doing in our life. We thank you in advance for the, the purpose that you have for us, and thank you for putting eternity into our hearts to know that there is a better place for us to go uh, during the difficult, uh, after the difficult years that we face here on this earth. Help us to be faithful all the days of our life. Help us to be good examples to others. Um, help us to uh, share some good news as we have opportunity. Now, dismiss, dismiss us in your grace this evening. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. Thank you, everybody, for watching online. Thank you all for being here this evening.